morning. Begin our worship service singing, Be Exalted, O God. You may be seated. I'm going to invite the choir and the ushers to come forward at this time as I share some announcements and Pastor Luke comes forward to pray. Um, Oswald Chambers has said, when we lose sight of God, we become hard and dogmatic. We hurl our own petitions at God's throne and dictate to him as to what we wish him to do. We do not worship God, nor do we seek to form the mind of Christ. If we are hard towards God, we will become hard towards other people as well. We do not want to be in that position. And we're going to talk a little bit more how not to be in that position. But prayer is a primary element. By the way, um, you saw the little Christmas boxes walking around. Are they still in their box uniforms? Okay. All right. Uh, those, those, that's to remind you Operation Christmas Child. In two weeks the, is the final Sunday to bring in boxes of uh, Christmas gifts for children around the world. And you just fill a shoe box, make sure there's nothing that's 
uh, pointed toward um, any kind of violent, like army men and those kind of things, because some nations that might trigger something that's a negative for them. So make sure it's, it's very uplifting stuff. Don't put any liquids in there. There's a whole host of things you can find out from the table as to what is allowed and what isn't allowed into a box. And if you are saying, like, I don't know how to put a box together, and you want to just give money toward that, you can do that as well. Gloria Bush is our coordinator for that. On the 16th, we want to dedicate these boxes of gifts and send them off and ask God to give them to who needs them to be received. The uh, Samaritan's Purse, who is the coordinator for the Operation Christmas Child, puts in every single shoebox a gospel track, so no matter where it goes in the world, they hear about the love of Jesus Christ, and they experience the love of Christ by receiving that box from someone they've never met and yet cares enough to participate in this program. So we're asking you to uh, help in this way in sharing the love of Christ in a very practical fashion. And so if you didn't bring your box today, you got next week and the following Sunday, and then, uh, and then we're, we're done receiving the boxes, and then we have this packing party where we go and make sure everything is, is filled up. So you can contribute a box of stuff, you can just bring stuff in, or you can help financially that way. Also, I just need to remind you of this because it's starting uh, the senior, it's called the Senior Christmas Party, Come Be a Guest at Bethlehem Inn. Um, you need to register and get tickets to go to that, and that can be done through Terry Erickson. She's been in the entryway this morning, but I just need you to know that just don't show up. You want, there is a limited space, and so we want to make sure that uh, when you come that you have your ticket with you. Other announcements, I'm going to have you read on your own, and I'm going to have Pastor Luke pray this morning. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that once again we get to come together and be a family, that we get, we get to receive the grace that you have for us, that we leak, and that you fill. So Lord, please fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can have a holy life. Lord, we have requests and needs that need to be brought before you because you are our provider. You give us every good thing, and you don't leave us lacking. So Lord, we pray for those who need a healing touch, for those who are hurting in this body, but you are the healer of the body and of the soul. Lord, I pray specifically for um, Fran Lee, who has um, had to go to the hospital, Lord, and could not be with us here today. Lord, we pray that um, you heal her and that you give the doctors wisdom and guidance in how to treat her and how to um, bring her back to the fullness that you would have for her. And pray for Diane Wickstrom, who is hurting in her back, Lord, um, this debilitating pain, and that you would put your hand upon her and heal. Lord, it is so good that you, um, that you do heal, that you care about these mortal bodies, and that even as these mortal bodies waste away, that you renew the inner person. And so we can have courage and can take heart that you have not abandoned us that you are a good father that gives us good things, and that when we ask, you listen, and when we cry out to you, you save us. And Lord, we praise you for that, that you are good. We pray that you are exalted in the world and in this place this morning. Help us to be light in this dark world. We praise you. Amen.
invite you to stand if you desire as we continue the worship of the Lord in singing to his glory. We're going to follow a CD today, so here we go.
God, you are so magnificent and so wonderful. You deserve the praise of your people. I pray, Father, as we, as we seek to be in your presence through worship, that we'll be hungry for your presence on a day-to-day -day basis. Come, Lord Jesus, fill us with your presence, and then direct us as how we should live. I pray in your beautiful name. Amen. Lord, oh, it's great to be in your presence. God Almighty, ah, as we go into the word of God, that we would indeed hunger, hunger to know truth, hunger to apply truth. Father, as we move toward the communion table in a few moments, that we would be mindful by your Holy Spirit of the great significance of that celebration. The incredible sacrifice, the mercy, the grace that was bestowed upon us so that we could even attempt to approach God. Stir our hearts now, Lord, from your word, I pray. 
Please, God, transform us. Make us different than when we entered here. And let it be everlasting. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you, as you can tell, I wanted to keep going. We'll get back there. We are continuing the series on the holy living, and, sorry about that, in our holy living series we were mindful that God exists and has existed eternally as three distinct personalities, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in one divine essence. It is Jesus who redeems us from our sins, calling us to holy living. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, which we talked about last week, and therefore should be set apart for a holy purpose. The Apostle Paul asked a very unique question that we're going to begin the service with today, the message, a very important question in 1 Corinthians 2.16 regarding holy thinking, and that's the focus today. He asked this question, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Now think about that before we just gloss over to the next part. Who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? It goes along really well with the quote from your bulletin this morning. But we have the mind of Christ. How does that happen and what is that? We hear that if you grew up in church Memorize scripture, that might be one of the scriptures you memorize. We have the mind of Christ. What does that mean exactly? Those are the things we're going to look at this morning. The first thing is that it's a devoted mind. This is the mind of Christ, that there is great devotion. When, when the people, in, when Christ was walking on earth and they came up to Jesus and they wanted him to expound and say, okay, what is the greatest commandment that's out there? Looking, of course, at uh, the Old Testament and the laws of Moses and so forth that God gave through Moses. They asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And he said in Mark 12, 29 and 30, the foremost is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Notice the phraseology, by the way, for us who are Trinitarian. The Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. In essence, as we break that down in the language, and I'm not a Greek scholar, and I won't pronounce these Greek words correctly, you'll never know either, unless you are a Greek scholar, so it doesn't matter. But the first thing is, is we need to look at how it's addressed. Jesus' response was, Hero Israel, the Lord our God. He just didn't say our God. He said the Lord our God is one Lord. Twice he said Lord. That word Lord is Kyrios. It means owner. He whom a person or thing belongs. And so if we attribute ourselves to God and we say we are his and, and, he, and he is our master, he is our Lord, we are saying he is our owner. That means everything the owner wants, the owner gets. So first of all, Jesus says, we need to understand the concept, the Lord our God is one Lord. God is Lord over all. And if we subscribe and surrender to him as Savior, then we are saying we surrender to him as Lord. Owner. And then he says, we are to love God then with our complete self, our entire being. And he covers that under heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when he uses the word heart, the Greek word is something like cardia. And you can kind of see where cardiac might come into there, into the play. But that is representing, that defined as the center of all physical and spiritual life. 
Obviously, the, Scienti the sciences of the day back when this was written are different than they are today. And they saw that the heart was the center of all physical and spiritual life. And so, Paul, or, and, and so we're, we're reading here, Jesus is saying that when you love the Lord, your owner, you love him with your complete self, the center of your life both physical and spiritual. And then he says, you love the Lord your God with all your soul. The, the, it looks like psyche, but it's actually pronounced like sashe or something like that. It's the moral being designed for everlasting life. It is the breath of life. Remember when Adam and Eve, or when Adam, excuse me, was created, and it says God came and he breathed into the nostrils and gave life to Adam. This was the moral he, he gave Adam morality. There is no other, anything else in creation that has morality because humanity was created in the image of God. And he breathed into Adam the breath of life, the morality that identifies what it is to be moral. And he says we need to take that soul then and love God completely with our morality. We are to love God with our mind, dione. The mind is a faculty of understanding, feeling, desire, the understanding of who God is. We are to love God completely with our understanding and our feelings and our desires completely. And we're to love the Lord our God with all of our strength that Esech is the ability, all force, all strength, all might, everything within this muscular frame. Not really, obviously. Oh, you must think that's true. That, thank you very much. <laughs> but every ounce of energy that you and I possess, we are to love God with that. That covers the entire human persona, heart, soul, mind and strength. And Jesus said we are to love God as our owner, but to love him, not love uh, the, the concept that we're slaves, although we are slaves to the master, right? But to love the owner because the owner is benevolent and the owner is merciful and the owner is gracious and the owner provides salvation and the owner redeems us and the owner delivers us. And because of that, we love the owner with all our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. Everything within us says, I love you and I'm going to obey you and follow you because you love me so deeply. That's the devoted mind. That's the mind of Christ. Here comes the hard part, what I consider the hard part. And that's, that's hard. I mean, that's, that, to do that, to say it, yes, to do it's hard. But this is even harder because we see each other, and that is the surrendered mind. The second greatest commandment Jesus said was this, Mark 12, 31. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandments than these two. Okay, I get it. Love God with all my being. What does it mean to love someone like myself? In Philippians 2.5, and we're going to explore that whole passage here in a few moments, but it says this, have this mind. The Greek term here for mind is phronio. It's different than the mind used in the book of Mark. But it says, have this mind in you, which is in Christ Jesus. So again, it's the mind of Christ. In this case, the phronio terminology is defined in two, two phases. One is to have understanding. And that's exactly what the dianoi, the mind in Mark said, the mind as a faculty of understanding. And the phronio also is to have understanding. So it's really understanding our position of putting Christ first and the position of understanding the things of God. The second part is to seek. This is a part of the definition of mind here, is to seek, to strive to. So it isn't just understanding it, it's to reach after it. It's a claw for it. 
is to try to gain it in two ways. According to Philippians 2, we're going to look at verses 1 through 18. The first way is harmony with others through humility. And I said, when we, get through, when we get to this part, when we get start reading this stuff, you're going to go, oh, man, I know some people that this, it, this isn't possible. It, it is, because we have to surrender to God, all right, and give him our all. In Philippians 2, 1 through 5, it says this, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, by the way, the Apostle Paul is writing this to the Christians in Philippi. He said, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being, here it is, Paul writing to the Christians in Philippi, being of the same mind. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard another person, believer in this case, as more important than you. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude, this mind in yourselves, here it is again, which is also in Christ Jesus, the mind of Christ. Okay, I'm going to put this out now so you have time to really process this. We're coming to the communion table. <laughs> And every time we, I preach a message, you know, I always, when we get to the communion, it's always like, okay, the scripture says we are to examine ourselves before we come to the table. Because if we don't examine ourselves correctly, the Holy Spirit will examine us. And for this reason, some are sick and some die. It's a very serious thing. It's a celebration, it's reverent, but it's serious. And so now I'm talking about loving other people. I'm just sharing you what the word says, but I'm explaining it to you, okay? So the question we have to ask ourselves as we're getting ready to approach the, the communion table is, are we loving other people in the way that God expects us to? Don't answer this question out loud, but I'm going to answer it, a ask it. Do you love others? Do you put their interests above your own? Now with family, that's yeah, pretty easy. Not always. Well, not always, but usually. It's pretty easy, because you love them, right? I mean, it's like, ah, yeah, that's, this is family. But that jerk that cut me off in traffic, pfft, I don't love him. That guy that doesn't believe the way I do politically, I don't love him that much. The person that I feel took advantage of me, of, of even my benevolence, it's really hard to love that person that much. And yet the scripture doesn't say, there's, here's the exceptions. It said, put... Those, people's above, those people above yourself. Here's the hard part. Every time. You don't want to go to communion right now, do you? You want me to keep going, don't you? As I, I, I said, I, you know what? This speaks to me before it ever speaks to you as I'm preparing it. Because this is the mind of Christ. What did Jesus say in, back in Mark? He said, yes, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But listen, it's just as important, or not just as important, but it's right up there, almost equal to that, is that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Those people, those neighbors that are moving the boundary lines, and we want to you know, pull it back to where it belongs, love them. Those people that offend us, love them. Those people that... Uh, you're not supposed to say jerk in church, but if I did, it would be like those jerks that, you know, we can't stand. Not that I did. It was your subconscious speaking. This is the hard part. And go back. let's go back again before we go on to the second part. Remember, this is the understanding, that the definition of mind here is understanding to seek and to strive for these things. Not just be aware of them but that we actually work toward them. We, we go after them. And it brings harmony with others, comes through 
humility, and isn't that what humility is, is putting someone above yourself? Isn't that humility? I mean, when someone barks at you, what's the first natural inclination we have? Bark back, bark louder, bare your teeth. Okay, get the upper hand. Well, that's not God. That's self. And within the framework of the church, and I'm not talking about just ours, but within the Christian body, the Christian family, it says all people we should consider more important than ourselves. Bear in mind that then that means that the other people should consider us more important than them. It's supposed to be an equal thing, but we're not responsible for how they think. We're only responsible for how we treat it and deal with it. And then he ends with, have this attitude, this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the first part of that mind definition is harmony with others through humility. The second part is holiness through humility. In verse 6, it goes on and says, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not e regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Who are we talking about? Jesus even though he existed with equality with God, he did not regard that as just something that was casual, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Think of that. I know it's hard for us to do that, but here you have the king, if I can put it in natural terms. You have, the, you have the king, and the king is going to bring himself down to the level of the subjects so that he can identify with them and they with him. And even though he never has to do that because he's the king, he's the owner, he's the master, he says, I love you too much to leave you in your miserable, wretched, sinful state. And so he took the form of a bondservant made in the likeness of men, found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, which was a shameful thing because that was for those who were truly guilty and vile, even though he was not. And for this reason also God had highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Just a reminder that even though the king surrendered himself to be smitten and killed and crucified, he is still the king, and one day every knee shall bow on heaven, earth, and under the earth, and they will proclaim the king is still alive, and the king is still on the throne. Amen. Oh, you guys, you Scandinavians, you're so reserved. <laughs> so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. Now, Paul's writing. He says, he's talking to the Christians in Philippi. He says, now you have always obeyed, not just when I'm there physically, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Listen, this is a part of our spiritual growth. The, the joy of salvation is we're redeemed from our sins and we're adopted into the family of God. The work out your salvation is moving in that holiness of the Spirit every single day. It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. As the owner, he has that right. As the subjects, as the slaves, because we love him so much, it's like, Lord, you work in me according to your will and your good pleasure. Listen, because he loves us so much, his will and his pleasure is our perfection in holiness. His will and his pleasure is that we would be what he knows we are supposed to be. He never wants what's wrong for us. He only wants what's right. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and work for his good pleasure. So do all things without grumbling or disputing. That brings us back to the reality that we are human beings 
And as much as we would love to be up here, Paul realizes, you guys, you keep messing up. And listen, I'm talking about all of us, okay, Christians. And, here's a, and I'll show you the reason why in just a second here. But we need to continue to seek after, with the understanding of the mind of Christ, seek, strive after the holiness through harmony in this case. It says, do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain or toil in vain. This is a pastor's heart, okay? This is a pastor's heart. That all the, all the energy and all the stuff that God's called us to share, that when Christ returns, it'll be like, <laughs> this is awesome. We'll be, we'll be like proud parents, okay, watching all the people that we've been called to invest life in. That's what Paul's saying. I don't want to be embarrassed. I, don't, I, want, I, want, I want to just be the excitement and see the glory of Christ in you. Because I did not run in vain or toil in vain. I didn't give up. I didn't stop and say, oh, this, is a, this, this job will never work. This is never going to be. Listen, the one thing that we joke about as a, as a pastor with police officers, you know that I'm a law enforcement chaplain, is that both of us have, have job security as long as there's sin in the world. Okay? We do. Not that that's a good thing, really, but, but that's what God's called us to. But that's not always going to be the case. One day there is going to be that day of judgment and that day of glory and the new heaven the new earth and so forth and paul says i have reason to glory now and i want greater greater reason to glory later but even if i'm poured out as a drink offering now he's talking about his physical life even if i am sacrificed to the service of your faith even when i'm put to death he's saying i rejoice and share my joy with you you too i urge you rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me in what fashion is he talking live in harmony of the faith of jesus christ Christ. Keep Christ before you. And measure your life based on Christ, not based on somebody else. Because you have a devoted mind and a surrendered mind. Listen, I'm, you and I both know that we are never, never going to put someone's interest above our own unless we have surrendered to Christ to give us the power and the ability to do so. And unfortunately, what happens usually is we, we run back to the old way of doing it. And that's why he says work out your salvation because we have, to, we have to keep working at it. We have to keep working at it. The more we work at it, the easier it becomes. But we have to keep working at it. And that brings us to the renewed mind. Because if unless our mind is renewed, we will not position ourselves in those other areas continuously. Salvation brings holy reconciliation. This is the glory of God. We're going to move to Colossians real quick. Colossians 1, 19 through 20. For it was the Father's, it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, in Jesus, and through Jesus to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross, through Jesus, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you and I, those who are followers in Christ, he has reconciled us in his fleshly body through death in order to present us before God the Father, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, this, we're talking about your salvation, okay? We're talking about the good works of God. You should be dancing in the pews, although I know we never would do that. But, but, but this is exciting stuff because it says, it says salvation brings reconciliation. Listen, that moment that we recognize that we are sinners and we're separated from God and we surrendered to him and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I repent. I'm not going back there. And I surrender to you. And Christ comes in us. We are reconciled to God. And then Jesus has come and says, here is the holy 
child adopted into your family. Holy. Let's break that down. Surrendering brings holy continuation. It starts with holy reconciliation, but then there's holy continuation, and then we're going to break that into three parts. Colossians 1.23 says, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and there's, there's a condition, continue in the faith, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. What he's, what he's saying there is if you continue, is surrender is a continuation process. Working out your salvation. It's a continuation process. Being holy, being sanctified, comes with salvation, but it's a continuing process. So number one, Keep seeking things above. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Here it is again. Set your mind on the things above, not the things on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. That's the exciting news. But we must set our minds. That is a deliberate act, by the way. It is not something that happens naturally. Matter of fact, the natural part of our life is if we don't strive after, we don't seek after God and his holiness, then we will diminish and move away from it and lose ground. So first of all, seek things above Secondly, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Therefore, Colossians 3, 5 through 7, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is, amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. Meaning what? That you should not walk in them again. I had, I had an epiphany this morning, and I wasn't able to fulfill it. I was checking with a couple people who said, who has a dead animal hanging in their house? I couldn't find the right family. And so if you have a dead animal hanging in your house, you're like a deer head or you know, a stuffed mink or something, I was going to use it as an illustration. Because if I, if I had a deer cat, or what do you call it, cape, you know, deer head here with the antlers, all I had is antlers at home. If I, if I had a deer head here, and I put it there, and I said, all right, deer Get up and walk. Well, number one, it doesn't have any legs. Okay? And number two, you would say, well, you're nuts. The thing's dead. I remember doing this one time when I was in South Dakota. It was probably, probably wasn't the right thing to do, but I was younger then. And as I'm walking into the church, it's one of the, you know, some little sparrow or something had flew into the window and, poof, and died, and it was laying right there. And so I scooped it up because I was preaching on this kind of thing. And so I, during the service, I had this bird, and nobody knew it. I said, okay, I've got this bird here. But it hit the window and died. But fly! And then pfft, this dead bird hit the ground. Yeah, those of you who love animals, I know, I was a, I'm a hard case. And I did that a couple times. Fly! You know, and everybody got the point. It's dead, Pastor. It's not going to fly. If we are dead in our trespasses and sins... We are not supposed to fly. You get it? And that's what Paul's telling us here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Consider your members of earthly body as dead to immorality, dead to impurity, dead to passion and evil desires and greed, which amounts to idolatry. It shouldn't exist in a believer anymore. So to have this renewed mind, we need to be reconciled, of course, to God, then surrender through keeping things above and considering the members of the past that are dead, actually dead, and then put on love. What can be the, what can be the, the most, the, the opposite of, of something that's dead would be something that's alive and ripe and, and passionate. That's love. Colossians 3, 12 through 14, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy 
and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. And whoever has a complaint against you, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Harmony leads to holiness. That's the second part we're looking at. Every time we read what our life should be like in Christ, it's an act of the will. Put on compassion. Put on kindness. Put on humility and gentleness and patience. It doesn't just land on us. We must strive with the mind of Christ to achieve it. It begins, first of all, to understand it's important to God. Who is the owner? And if we truly want to love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, then we will strive to seek these things in him and for him. So to have the mind of Christ, we must be mindful of Christ. Number one, saturate yourself in Scripture. Listen, this is also in the book of Colossians. Great book. In Colossians 3.16, it says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I don't think I've ever had anybody admonish me with music other than the Holy Spirit. There has been times when my attitude has been really bad. My family experiences the wrath of my badness, and then I turn on the radio or something, and then there's a song that talks about the glory of God and how you should walk in His goodness, and it's either like, I can either turn it off, or I can ask God for forgiveness and go to my family and ask them for forgiveness. Which is it I want to choose? Am I going to strive and seek after God? Or am I going to try to live in the deadness of the old life? So saturate yourself in Scripture. Scripture will bring to mind how we are to live. The only way you can saturate yourself, yourself with something is to be into it. The word saturate really means what? To be overwhelmed by it, right? I mean, when you saturate something, you, you put it in until it's completely submerged. Saturate yourself with Scripture. Instruct and correct with Scripture. That's ourselves first, but also as a loving person, not to get even with somebody. And I know that sometimes it's very easy to find Scripture that you can do that with. But it's not to get even. It's because you love someone so much and your interest is for them is higher than your own. So it's like, even though my relationship may be a little tough at this point, I'm going to go to that person because I love that person too much and show them what God's Word says about this certain thing that they might be engaged in. Instruct and correct with Scripture and then worship together with thanksgiving. We were having this discussion uh, just yesterday at the Making the Healthy Disciples and and I was saying that there's only one verse in the Bible that's really dis distinct about being in the house of God and worshiping with God's people is Hebrews 10.25. It says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We are built to worship God with others. We are built to share our spiritual gifts with others. We cannot isolate ourselves from others who are followers of Christ. God is glorified as we worship in harmony. And then do all the work in the name of the Lord as unto the Lord. Colossians 3.17 and then 23 and 4 says this. Whatever you do, listen very close, listen very close, because we apply this normally to church stuff. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, let me say it again, whatever you do, you brushing your teeth? Are you doing something? Whatever you do. You disciplining your children? Whatever you do. Are you working at work? 
whatever you do. Are you talking to the neighbor about your sore muscles? Whatever you do. Are you talking to your neighbor about somebody else? Whatever you do. Do in, in work or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. The world knows what it is to walk with immorality and to be grumbling and dissentful and, and talk against people and, and, and try to stir up problems and say, I'm not satisfied with life and I'm not content. But a believer who truly loves God has a contentment. And that should be demonstrated in whatever we do. And then giving thanks through him to God the Father. Verse 23, whatever you do, do your work heartedly as for the Lord rather than for men. Now for me, that's pretty easy. I'm a preacher. I love preaching. I am in the zone as a pastor. I, don't, I wouldn't want to do anything else, although I obviously love law enforcement stuff, but that's not what God called me to. He called me to this, and I want to do this. I want to stay healthy. I want to be like Moses, live to 120, and then, you know, die on a mountain someplace. I just, this is what I love to do. You may be in a job that that's not the case, but there's no permission slip here that says, well, in that case, grumble. It isn't there. It says, whatever you do, do your work heartedly as for the Lord. You are serving the owner. You're not serving his supervisors. You're serving the Lord rather than men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. Imagine that, that when we're serving people, and maybe people we don't like, maybe bosses we don't like, and I've had bosses that I didn't get along with, and we're serving them, and it's like, I want to cut corners. You know why people rob from their companies? You know, they steal pens and pencils and paper clips and stamps and, and steal rods and shovels and picks and whatever. You know why people do that? Because they feel like, I'm not getting what I deserve, so I'm going to take it because I deserve it. Now you tell me that's serving the Lord. Scripture says, whatever you do, do as unto the Lord, because you're serving God in your job, in your marketplace, in your neighborhood. You are not serving men. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And finally, devote yourselves to prayer. Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. That's, you know, that quote that we read, and I don't have my bulletin here. Yeah, there it is. But it sounds kind of harsh, but, but look, look at that quote again. And this is uh, by Oswald Chambers. By the way, he's got a great book, um, really hard sometimes to go through it, a devotional book. Um, because he's a very deep thinker, but he says, when we lose sight of God, we become hard and dogmatic. When we don't put him first, we lose sight. We become hard and dogmatic. We hurl our own petitions at God. In other words, the focus of our prayers are not now to glorify him and to worship him and to enjoy him. It's to say, God, I got this issue and you need to deal with it. Now, we would never say that as believers. We would never, no, well, I never do that. But the reality is we do. The moment we start putting God in a position of give me rather than a position of glory, then we says here we hurl our petitions at God's throne and dictate to him as to what we wish him to do. We do not worship God, nor do we seek to form the mind of Christ. If we are hard towards God, we will become hard towards others. Now that's not scriptural, but it's a practical truth. What do we start with? Have this mind in you that we would have the mind of Christ. Living such a holy life will foster a holy thinking that God intended and brings him glory. And I tell you, this, this, this holy life series is tough. Oh, it's tough. <laughs> well, let me give you assurance. It's not going to get any easier. Until we surrender 
and say, God, this is where I need to be. It won't get any easier. Because the Holy Spirit loves us too much to let us wander in the selfishness of man. He says, i got a greater, a greater life for you than you can possibly imagine, but you're going to have to give up some of that childish dead stuff and surrender yourself to the Master. So this morning, before we come to communion, I didn't even check to see how many elders we had today. How many have we got? We got one. Dave, are you here? There's one Dave. Is there another Dave? There's a Jim. I'm counting because I'm trying to figure out how to do communion this morning. If we don't have enough to serve, ah, you're going to get any. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. John's here. We got a plenty. But what I'm, what I'm trying to share with you is that as we come to the communion table, now you just heard, and I have to admit, this is a hard message. If you're not in a position of surrender, whew, it's tough. That's why I started off a little while ago saying, listen, the scripture says examine yourselves. That is not a casual statement. It is not. It is in the New Testament. It is written by one under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, listen, this is, a, this is a serious thing. When you take communion, it is a time to celebrate the sacrifice God made in our behalf. Definitely. To remember the cracker or the bread that represents the body of Christ that was bruised for our iniquity. To remember the blood, the cup that represents the blood of Christ that was shed for our sins. That's a, that's a wonderful thing to recall. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. But he says, you know what, this is, this is a sanctified, reverent act of worship. And don't you dare just go through the motions. Because if you don't examine yourselves correctly, the Holy Spirit will examine you. And for this reason, some have gotten sick and some have died. That's the emphasis God puts on it. So going in a hard, hard series like this about walking in holiness and, and, and putting other people above your own interests, it's like, oh, I can't, I can't. There's this one guy or there's one girl. I can't. And no matter how hard I try, that person is, ugh, I just can't. God says, yes, you can. Because the scripture also says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's the act of the will of surrendering to what God wants. He will put in the ability if we position ourselves in surrender to him in those areas of our life. So let's take a few moments of silence and seek our heart before God. Say, Lord, is there any area here that I'm hearing today? Is there anything here or anything that would prevent me from taking communion today? I want to celebrate God's goodness. But I don't want to bring the judgment of God upon me because I'm ignoring something that you're trying to bring in light, in a light to me and my conscience. Let me pray, and then I'm just going to give a few moments of silence. I'm going to ask Mary Jo to play as, as you're praying. And then I'm going to ask our elders to come forward that we can serve the communion elements. Lord, I don't know if this is a true statement. It sounds like an oxymoron, but this is refreshingly hard. When we come to grips with the reality of God and your glory and your holiness and how we have this propensity to be the exact opposite of that, thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Jesus, that you have told us as followers and believers in Christ that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and you are just and you will forgive us of that sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we can come to the table and rejoice and celebrate the holiness of God that is planted in us by your Spirit. Lord, I do pray if there's anyone here that is struggling with what it means to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength demonstrated by loving others more than ourselves. That you will woo them and love them and understand your mercy, but also your expectation. Hear now the prayers of your people as they seek to know your truth in their own personal life. And as you reveal that, if there's areas there people need to hear, that they will confess it before you and feel the joy and the release and the freedom 
to come to the table, O Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Just take a few moments of silence now as you pray to him. Father, I thank you so much for this, what we call the Lord's table, that you, Father, desire and also call us to be mindful of what you did for us, that we could indeed experience the joy of salvation, and to remind us to walk in the holiness of God. Thank you for the crackers that represent your body that was bruised for our iniquities. And through that beating and those stripes, we can know even a physical healing within this life. You are great and awesome God, and I bless your name. I ask the worship team if they'll come forward, and elders, if you will stand, please. As we worship together, you are welcome to remain seated or stand however you uh, desire to worship God as we sing this song. We're going to pass out the elements and we'll continue on with a cup after the crackers have been passed. And then following that, again, I want to remind you that in the body of Christ, there is healing in his wings, divine healing for the human body. And so if you would like prayer this morning and, and, and asking God to bring healing to you, then just come up to the front after we're done with communion and... Um, during the second song, and we will pray over you. Go ahead.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this bread. As we consume it, Lord Jesus, we know it has no magical power. We know that there's nothing mystic about it. It's a symbol of the flesh of the body of Christ that was bruised for our iniquities. And we take it as a reminder that we have the life of Christ in us. Be glorified now, now, Lord Jesus, as we eat together. Let's eat together. After the bread was taken at the end of the Passover meal, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is a cup of redemption. Drink this in remembrance of me. Father, as we receive this cup, be glorified. And again, remind us of the joy of our salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's start. Heavenly Father, as the cup continues to be passed, I just want to say thank you. Lord, we cannot put our minds around what it, what it took to die on the cross at the hands of your own creation. It is far beyond our imagination, but we know by faith that God the Son came in the form of of a man lived died and was resurrected totally sinless so that we might have the privilege of being redeemed from our sins thank you mighty God for this cup that represents all of that during this time of service I pray in Jesus name Amen drink together. Scripture says, as long as you eat this bread and drink of the cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. I'm going to ask that you would stand as we sing this final song. And again, if you would need prayer for healing of any kind, please come forward and we will pray over you according to the Scriptures. <laughs>
Hallelujah, God. Lord, continue to mold us into your image, to make us in the way that only you can to walk in holiness. Give us, Lord, the heart's desire to seek after you with an understanding of who you are, to understand what you desire of us, that we would strive and seek, Lord, to walk and be renewed and transformed by the power of Christ every day working in us. Thank you for the privilege of salvation and that we can represent you, our Savior. Bring healing, Lord, for those who have called for healing. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, be merciful and show a miracle in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming. Go in God's peace.